Among the mission statements of COVA is attention to creation care. When we discuss creation care here, we refer to the ethical responsibilities we have to the non-human world, which includes the nature surrounding us and the other animals with whom we share this planet. In creation care, these responsibilities are based on the value imputed to creation by God and based on his participation in divine redemption. From the first chapter of Genesis, we understand reality to be divided into two parts, God and everything else, the latter of which is creation. Granting that this world is temporary and passing away, creation retains value and deserves ethical consideration not only because it belongs to the Lord, but also because it is part of the redemption through Christ. In Isaiah chapter 11, we have a picture of creation redeemed to its original state. And in Romans 8, we learn that non-human creation needs Christ's salvific power and work just as much as human beings. Psalm 104 highlights the union of all creation under the invention and provision of God. And Psalm 148 devotes all 14 lines to the praise given to God by all creation including celestial beings, terrestrial and marine creatures, and inanimate structures like mountains. Creation care is not based on a deification of nature, but on recognition of the deity who created nature. If nothing else, we are to steward creation well because it is created by God and valuable, irrespective of its usefulness to us. In introducing evangelical ecotheology, seven biblical foundations are given for creation care. First, humans were tasked with being earth keepers, which entails guardianship, protection, and preservation. Second, the well-being of humankind is dependent on the well-being of the planet. We are all, in the biblical theology of the covenant, banded in this together. Third, responsible stewardship at aim for creation care respects the artistry of God's creation. Fourth, creation care conveys a particular ecological character that is rooted in virtue and in agreement with the kind of person that Jesus was and is. Fifth, ecological crises affect the underprivileged at a rate disproportionate to their contributions to those crises. And the spirit of Christian compassion and care for such groups compels concern for creation care. Sixth, creation care aspires to the harmony of original creation, a hope that Jesus brought through his life, death, and resurrection. Seventh and last, we remember that until the last days, generations will follow us, and we have a responsibility to give them a habitable world in which their ability to live and live well is not inhibited by past negligence or disregard. Though faith-focused, the legitimacy of creation care is not unanimously recognized among Christians. The term emerged in the 1990s and gained traction during the later years of the Bush administration to rally the evangelical Christian voting bloc to the environmental cause. What began with optimistic outlooks ended with political failure as a result of ideal mismatches, lack of cultural understanding, and relationships that were shallow and instrumental. Hayden Ludwig, a senior investigative researcher at the investigative think tank Capital Research Center, for one, does not think highly of the movement. In his multi-part series, Ludwig condemns creation care as a gateway for secularists to infiltrate conservative churches and therein preach their progressive policies as gospel truth. According to Ludwig's evaluation of the matter, this pseudo-Christian creation care idea is a, quote, product of environmentalist ideology, not genesis. This ideology inverts the biblical understanding of man's relationship with nature 
by teaching that humanity is a blight upon the earth, end quote. Freelance science journalist Chris Burdick notes that alarm bells about creation care being little more than, quote, a Trojan horse from the left meant to subvert Christianity with nature worship, end quote, have been ringing from many pulpits for years. Members of the Cornwall Alliance, a prominent network of evangelical Christian scholars that advocate for earth stewardship, economic development, and the gospel, brand environmentalism as both a theological threat in a social threat, in supposed derivation from pantheistic belief systems and de-emphasis on human importance. This allergy to environmentalism is not uncommon, nor is it entirely without foundation. Environmentalism, including concern for non-human animals, is, as Charles Camozzi pointed out in his book For Love of Animals, generally associated with the, quote, sentimental views of the far left, end quote, a political position not known for religiosity. Lynn White Jr., a medieval historian who ignited the bay on the relationship between Christianity and ecology, argued in his seminal 1967 essay that Christianity, as the most, quote, anthropocentric religion the world has seen, end quote, made the exploitation of nature possible by devaluing it in relation to mankind and by believing that its existence hinges on its usefulness to man. Add to that the belief of some that religion and environmentalism are outright incompatible, and you have a recipe for non-involvement and non-concern. This perceived animosity between Christianity and environmentalism is further realized when considering the religious and spiritual foundations of modern-day eco-theologies, or constructive theologies focused on the interrelationship between religion and nature. Rather than Christianity, the concepts promoted often have Buddhist, Hindu, or neo-pagan roots. In the view of Jurassic Park author Michael Christian, Environmentalism itself has become a religion, the, quote, religion of choice for urban atheists, end quote. Christian frames environmentalism as a 21st century remapping of traditional Christian beliefs and myths, beginning with the state of grace, that is, unity with nature, the fall from grace, that is, pollution of nature, and a coming judgment day in which death is inevitable unless there be repentance, via sustainability. In light of all of this, how and where does creation care, which might be simplified to the term Christian environmentalism, fit? Are we capitulating to some sinister political plot when we embrace it? The answer is in the details. The environmentalism denounced in these Christian venues differs from the environmentalism advanced by creation care, though the latter can learn from the former and vice versa. John Murdoch, who describes himself as your, quote, typical tree-hugging conservative Christian, end quote, writes that the creation care movement is treated with disdain by a good number in evangelical America, the intended audience because evangelical leadership did not step into the breach during the rise of American environmentalism in the mid-20th century, which left non-Christian philosophies to influence the development of the ideology. Thus, when the sub-movement of creation care emerged, it was punted to the size of ploy of the generally non-sectarian environmentalism. The fault is in not recognizing creation care as something both connected and separate from this broader activism. Creation care is a form of environmentalism and also distinct from environmentalism. It is a form of environmentalism in the simple sense of the word, i.e. a movement concerned with the well-being of the natural world and the individuals affected in the ecological web of that world. It is distinct from environmentalism in the more politically and spiritually influenced sense of the word, i.e. a political ideology or secular faith. 
The difference between environmentalism in the second sense, the sense often found unpalatable to an American Christian audience, and creation care is the motivation. In the second sense, the motivation is utilitarian, based on preservation of the usefulness of creation for us, worshipful, based on conviction that the beauty, divinity, or goodness of creation needs to be protected, or humanitarian, based on a drive to provide well for the generations to follow and to, in a way, control the future. While the seven foundations previously listed for creation care agree with these three, the motivation for creation care is not any of them. It is theocentric, not anthropocentric or biocentric. It is based not in our love for creation, but in God's love for creation, a love that extends so far as to include the entirety of creation, not just human beings, in his redemptive work. Environmentalism that exalts creation as something divine might lead to an assembly-wide apology to plants. A love for nature that transcends its right order risks placement of nature as an object of worship and elevation of environmentalism to religion. The theocentric motivation of creation care makes a difference by caring for and delighting in the created without forgetting that its value as well as the command to steward it well, comes from the Creator. That the motivation to love creation derives from God's original love for it doesn't mean that creation care kicks the rest of the curb, like the essentiality of creation for human survival, the beauty of the world, or the wishes for the future generations. If anything, it enhances the rest, because in it we draw closer to seeing non-human creation how God sees it, and by extension, seeing other humans how God sees them.